Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Arthritis at Home, Arthritis Consumer Experts weekly program that uh, you are able to watch and listen to experts from across the country talk about important subjects around inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis. And today, we're joined by one of our ACE team members, Ellen Wang, our program's coordinator. Ellen, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Kelly. And we are going to talk today to our audience, Ellen, about the latest ACE National Survey, the third in 2022, the first two being on exercise and arthritis and arthritis and mental health. And this, our third that we're publishing in November is on health inequities. So to get us started, Ellen, before we dive into the survey results, when we talk about health inequities, what are we actually talking about? Great question, Kelly. I think, you know, when we hear the word inequity, we think the opposite of fair, right? So a lack of fairness. And health inequities actually, uh, in the context that we're speaking about it, are systemic differences. And these systemic differences are usually those in the distribution of health resources. So differences that are caused by how the system is structured. And this then manifests across different population groups. And usually these inequities have significant social and economic costs for both individuals and societies. What, what sort of impact do these health inequities have on the care and treatment and the health outcomes of patients? So we know from research in many different fields, not only rheumatology, that for example, if it is more difficult to access a healthcare resource, and that can be very explicit, or it can be something such as you live in a rural or remote community. It's a little bit more difficult to get to not only your GP, but also to get a referral to a specialist. That delay may cause a delay in diagnosis. Then, because of a delay in diagnosis, perhaps your condition will have further progressed, and that progression will then perhaps equate to greater symptoms. Greater symptoms may lead to poor health outcomes. And note the use of like the maze in, in the way I'm explaining it, because these are definite, but we also know that there is a correlation. There is an association between, for example, delayed diagnosis and our health outcomes. Well, let's, um, let's look at the survey now, Ellen. And before we start talking about findings and things that we've learned, um, maybe just tell us uh, at the outset uh, what this survey looked like, who participated in it, and anything else that you want to share. So the survey was our largest ever. So, you know, very, very excited to be able to gather all of this data. And we had actually conducted the survey in conjunction with Research Co., which is a marketing market research company. And they were really able to help us access a larger population. And, you know, I do find looking at the results, we had about 60% uh, female respondents, or sorry, individuals who uh, identified as women, 40 who identified as men, and about 1% that identified um, as part of the LGBTQ2S plus community. So you can see right off the bat, that's a little bit of a better distribution than we, we usually get. And, and then the data was analyzed, uh, looking at kind of separate groups. So we looked at BIPOC versus white. We looked at rural and remote versus kind of the metropolitan areas. And then we also looked at the distribution that I just talked about, which is individuals who identify as women, individuals who identify as men, and individuals that identify as non-binary. 
And they were asked a set of about 30 questions. And it really did range from questions about, you know, accessing care, questions about what are your interactions with your care provider, um, and then uh, questions about kind of some of the health outcomes that you've experienced. So really a range of information was captured. And just, just for our viewers, um, when we talk about BIPOC in this interview, we mean Black people of color and Indigenous. Yes. Um, and then just to go back to, this is the largest survey that we've done out of our national survey program. How many total respondents were there? There's over 1,200 respondents. So like huge thank you to everyone who participated. Um, let's start looking at some of the uh, some of the results. What are maybe some of the key um, key takeaways that you can share with us today? So some of the key takeaways kind of starting kind of from the uh, first questions that respondents answered were, you know, about their interactions with their care providers. So overall, I'm going to use the word overall, uh, individuals uh, part of the BIPOC community, so Black, Indigenous, and uh, person of color, rated their interactions less favorably than white respondents. So we know that right off the bat, overall. And I say overall because participants were asked to rate this interaction on a scale of 0 to 10. So across the board, it was slightly lower. And then we also know that BIPOC respondents value different things in care providers. So for example, speaking the same language, right? Sure. Same gender, same generation, same mm. racial and ethnic background. These are really important for individuals who are BIPOC. On the other hand, BIPOC respondents while they did value good listening skills, being involved in decision-making, that wasn't as much valued in BIPOC respondents as in white respondents. So we see that there is a clear difference there. So that's kind of what we learned at the beginning. And I think it's really important for us to acknowledge, even though these things may be apparent as a care provider, it's still great information to have. And then, the topic of discrimination, um, I think we all know that discrimination exists. The staggering um, results that we had in our survey showed that not only were BIPOC respondents, did they experience greater um, unfavorable uh, encounters, but this result was even more pronounced for Indigenous peoples. So, you know, I highly recommend that everyone read um, the Joint Health Insight Report to, to get those statistics because they're about, they're, they're, they're folds, folds higher. So, for example, um, Indigenous respondents had said they face discrimination often based on ethnicity 25% of the time. One in four, one in four Indigenous peoples experience discrimination often. So it really does give you a sense of wow, this is this is very explicit. Like this is this is not um something that we think is there. Maybe it's there. No, people are experiencing this. So I found that once again really great to have those numbers um, put to the actual problem. And then one of the, I think, really um, fruitful parts of the survey was we asked about information seeking habits. So where do people go to find information? And there's differences between uh, the Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So for example, BIPOC community members go to family, friends, coworkers, traditional healers, elders for health information more often than white respondents. We also know that um, rural and non-rural respondents sought out information from similar sources. So there doesn't seem to be a difference between rural and non-rural. 
So it just speaks to um, how we can best target our information to the different groups that we want to be able to help. And I think it was really great to see the differences and as well as similarities there. I think we um, should remind our viewers as well that if this is a topic that is of interest to them, and we hopefully it is, that um, the other national surveys that we've conducted this year and last year, we had broken down and looked at some of these health inequities and did sort of a sub-analysis. And so last year when we looked at virtual care, we looked at self-advocacy, um, we looked at access to medications. We did this kind of breakdown and it's actually that sub-analysis and the the observations and insights we got from those earlier surveys is what motivated us to focus on health inequities on this latest survey. So there is more information available if you go to our national surveys, you'll be able to see this kind of information broken down as well. Um, but certainly the impact of this survey, because it is focused and dedicated on health inequities, there are some big aha moments that you've identified, Ellen, and certainly people can find in the Joint Health Insights Summary Report as well. What, what can we do with this information? If we're gonna share it, not just with the patient community, but with the Canadian healthcare provider and rheumatology arthritis communities, um, what, what can we do with it? Uh, from a care provider's point of view, I want, you know, as a future clinician myself, noting in my head and in my mind and my heart that you don't know what the person who's walking into that appointment has experienced, not only in their past, they may have had several bouts of discrimination, racism, um, poor treatment, you know, things that have really turned them off from the healthcare system. So to be mindful that, yes, you absolutely do want to provide the best care you possibly can and, you know, inform them of all the possible decisions, but allow them space if they need a few days to decide, allow them space if they actually just want to rant to you about something, allow them the space if they want to say no, and maybe you can, you know, ask them again the next time they come in for um, for their appointment because it's about building a trusting relationship and that takes time. It's about not undoing the past because we can't do that, but you can do more now and in the future. Um, and for policymakers, I think noting that there are these health inequities and they do, or they are the result of structural differences in how resources are allocated and distributed to know that perhaps you want to talk to researchers about how we can really redistribute um, what is going to the healthcare system, how we can innovate with what we have to actually address some of these um, health disparities. We are a, a nation of many different cultural identities. And really what you're saying is, is our healthcare system uh, respecting and empathizing with all of these different cultural communities? And that means, are we providing in a arthritis context for arthritis patients care that the term, I guess, is culturally appropriate or culturally relevant? Are we delivering that? We need to ask ourselves that. And if we're not, what can we do? To achieve that. So I think those are really important findings that you've shared with us, Ellen. I think food for thought for patients, for healthcare providers, for policymakers. And it's certainly something in terms of a survey that ACE will be sharing and using as part of its advocacy efforts across Canada uh, when we are meeting with policymakers in the provinces and at the federal level as well. So I want to thank you for taking time out, Ellen, to walking us through this survey. There'll be links to this survey report at the end of this show. 
Um, there'll be links to some of those other surveys where you can see this type of analysis that we've conducted looking at uh, gaps in care as it relates to uh, different populations and patient group uh, populations. So we wanna thank you, our viewers, for spending time with us today on a really, really important topic. Alan, thanks again. And to all of you, we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of Arthritis at Home. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.